It's um, my pleasure to introduce our second speaker, uh, Dr. Rino Rapuoli, um, who's going to give us, is being recognized for pioneering the genomic approach known as reverse vaccinology used to develop a vaccine against menin meningococcus B, B which has um, saved many lives worldwide. Um, uh, Reno is uh, currently chief scientist and head ex uh, of external R&D at GSK Vaccines based in Siena, Italy. He's had many previous positions um, at various companies including Novartis and Chiron Corporation and he took up these positions after completing his PhD in biological sciences at the University of Siena and studying at Rockefeller University and Harvard Medical School in Boston. Um, Reno has made many astounding discoveries uh, that relate to the use of vaccines uh, currently today, including the concept that bacterial toxins can be detoxified uh, by manipulation of their genes, uh, the concept that microbes are better studied in their native environments than on their own in order to understand how they interact with cells or cellular microbiology, and the use of genomes to develop new vaccines, which is what we'll hear about today. Um, several of the molecules he's worked on have become part of licensed vaccines uh, that are in wide use around the world, including vaccines against the flu, uh, men meningitis, and pneumonococcus vaccines. And um, he is he's uh, had received many awards as well. Um, he was elected to the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, uh, to EMBO, and is a foreign member of the Royal Society of London. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Rina. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. And thanks to Gardner for this, uh, well, unbelievable honor to be here. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about vaccines. To talk about vaccines, I'll start a long time ago. Somehow, uh, from 12 million years ago, our planet was populated only by, by non-human primates. Uh, approximately 3 million years ago, uh, our species started to divert, divert from non-human primates, and through three million years of evolution, uh, basically got to approximately 60,000 years ago when uh, our predecessor went out of Africa and went up to Europe, Asia, and populated, populated our planet. Now, during the last few years, uh, really last four or five years. We learned a lot more about what happened during this period. And that has been due thanks to a new technology, genomics. Genomics is the ability to sequence the genomes. And in this particular case, the genomes of our predecessors that we sequence in very tiny pieces of bones that are found in the caves in uh, South Africa, Europe, Asia, and so on. By sequencing the genomes of our predecessors, we learn about our history. And it's amazing, I mean, just by sequencing these genomes. So that's, sequencing genomes will be a theme of my talk. Um, and I'll tell you one of the things we learned very recently about our evolution. Uh, historically, we, we thought that people uh, came out of Africa and that was it. And we knew there was a Neanderthal man that was uh, out there as a dead branch of the human evolution. And we thought the Homo sapiens, us, had never to do, nothing to do with them. But recently, sequencing the genome of Neanderthal men, we learned that we have 3% of their genes in our genome. So basically, they, they are relatives to us. So something we didn't know three, four years ago. So that's what we learned. And, um, and then we come to our days. One thing that when we study human evolution we never talk about is this red line, which is life expectancy. Now, this red line says that for three million years, we lived, our species had a life expectancy between 25 and 35 years. It's only back in 1750, life expectancy started to go up, and now is 85 years in, our, uh, in the Western world, and it's predicted to go without limits to 90 years. Uh, so this is the science. Uh, if you believe the Time magazine, that says that the children are born today are gonna live 142 years. That's not science, it's a prediction, but 85 years is real. Now, obviously it's remarkable. We gained 55 years since 1700. And we gained 35 years since 1900. 
My grandparents were living th had a life expectancy of 35 years. So the question is, what did happen? Why did we gain so much? What is, why so transformational? This is probably the biggest event that ever happened in, the human, in human history, 35 years in one century. Well, if you want to know why, you need to go to have data. And what I did, I went to the record of uh, mortality. I took the United States, where the records were more complete. And I went to 1900 and asked, what was the life expectancy in 1900 in the United States? 30, uh, 47 years. And then went up to 85 years today. And then the next question is, why people were, did not live that long? What was going on at that time? Why, what was the cause of mortality? So, and you look at that in the records that you will find the answer. And the answer will be the next slide. It will be that from infectious diseases and that's from any other cause. And in the slide you will see yellow will be infectious diseases uh, and red all the rest. And this is the answer. In 1900, 57% of the people died from infectious diseases. And they died very early, most of them in the first five years, and uh, all the others within the 25 years. And, and infectious diseases went down uh, uh, with, with time. Uh, today they're still, are still there, 5%, much less, still important. And with conquering infectious diseases basically increased our life expectancy. Even more interesting is which were the infectious diseases that killed all our predecessors. And well, fine, diphtheria. Diphtheria, none of the young people in the room have ever seen a case of diphtheria. But even people older than that have not seen them. But in 1900, a century ago, they were killing massive amount of people. Germany in 1900, 50,000 people that died from diphtheria. Less than a century ago, United States, 1920, 15,000 people died of diphtheria. Today, nobody has ever heard of diphtheria. And which were the other uh, diseases? Smallpox is not, doesn't exist anymore in our planet, but killed 300 million people in, in a couple of centuries. And which were the other diseases? Were pertussis, measles, typhoid fever, cholera, uh, <coughs> tetanus, I mean, all diseases have disappeared. And by conquering these infectious diseases, we've been able to gain 35 years of life expectancy. Not bad, yeah? Now, how do we conquer infectious diseases? Well, there have been three things. Hygiene, clean water, antibiotics, and vaccines. So now you understand why I like vaccines. I mean, they gave us quite a lot of uh, life expectancy. Many years we live much, much longer. And, and that's why I'm going to talk from now on about my experience with uh, vaccines. Um, vaccines basically started in 1796 with Jenner, with the Zumor Pock vaccines. Uh, the real development started with Pasteur a century later. And uh, the first phase of the two century of vaccine development ended with Maurice Hillman in the 1960s, 1970s, just 60 years ago. And vaccines up to the moment uh, were done in a pretty sim technologically simple way. Basically, what, to make a vaccine, you had to isolate a virus, a bacterium, or a parasite that causes the disease. To inactivate means killing it or uh, attenuating, so they will not cause disease, and inject it. So for, for two centuries, we've been making vaccines by isolating, growing, killing, and injecting pathogens. And then came 1980. In 1980, new waves of technologies start. So we had one in 1980, one in 1990, one in 2010, and today, if you ask me what's the future of vaccines, about new technology, this is my vision. We are living in a moment that is so exciting about new technology in, vaccine, in vaccines. Basically, the, today we can do things we couldn't do five years ago. In five years we'll do things we cannot do today. 
in 10, 15 years, we'll be able to do things that we can not even dream about today. And so I think it's a really an evolving field, extremely exciting, and uh, involves synthetic biology, structural vaccinology, knowledge of immune system, and so on. So that's my vision. Uh, now I'll go into my own experience. I'll start with my experience with the first wave of technology, which was uh, glycoconjugation, and I'll move on to the rest. So <laughs> conjugate vaccines, um, this is the elect um, light microscopy of three bacteria, Haemophilus influenza, Pneumococcus, Meningococcus. 1980, we did not have vaccines for three, these three bacteria. Today we have them, they're licensed, they save probably uh, and several hundred thousand uh, deaths uh, per year. But the amazing thing is in 1980, we didn't know how to make these vaccines. Um, and today are licensed. What happened in the meantime? Well, these bacteria, what they have in common, you see here electron microscopy, they have this kind of uh, orange uh, capsule that surrounds them. And the capsule is made by sugars, polysaccharides. Is a kind of gelatin that surrounds the bacteria. And if you look a little deeper at the chemical level, the, these polysaccharides are made by one repeating unit, which are defined chemical composition, it could be one sugar, two sugar, three sugars uh, combined, and, which is, and that repeating unit is repeated many, many, many times, and that's the polysaccharide. In 1960s, it was found that people that had antibodies to the polysaccharide would be protected from disease. So people say, well, let's make a vaccine. Let's purify the polysaccharide. They purify the polysaccharide. They made uh, vaccines, they licensed vaccines, but the results were very disappointing. These vaccines did not work in infants, and the major need for the, for the vaccines were in infants. They worked in the military, they worked uh, in adults a little bit in, for outbreaks, but really did not satisfy the things. And then we understood why these polysaccharide vaccines were not working. And we understood that these, polysac these are sugars, very hydrophilic, and they react very well with antibodies, when they, uh, with the receptors of the B cells. But they are so hydrophilic, they cannot interact with the receptor or the other part of the immune system, which are the T cells, because the receptor of the T cells evolved to bind peptides, and peptides are, have a lot of hydrophobic interactions, and the sugar, which is completely hydrophilic, doesn't fit that. So basically, we had a, a potentially exceptional vaccine, the polysaccharide, but unfortunately, could only talk to our B cells, could not talk to our T cells. And we needed to, a conversation between the two in order to make a good vaccine. So what was the solution? Well, the solution was simple. We, we have proteins that interact with the T cells. So we took this polysaccharide and linked them to a protein that can talk to the T cells. And now we have a vaccine, what we call conjugate vaccine, where the polysaccharide is linked to the protein. And this can really engage the conversation between B and T cells and solve the problem. So um, early 90s, uh, uh, the Haemophilus influenza was done, and as soon as we saw the uh, Haemophilus influenza was working, uh, I decided to work on meningococcus. And I made a conjugate vaccine for meningococcus C, and I did the experiment, a clinical trial in one, two years old children, and I tried the polysaccharide vaccine alone, as expected it didn't work, and the, the conjugate vaccine, the same polysaccharide just linked to the protein, worked beautifully. Uh, with this slide, I went to the United Kingdom because they had a lot of, many cases of meningococcus C. And when they saw this slide, they were very excited because they said, well now, for the first time, we can make a vaccine for a terrible disease like meningococcus C. And so we started to work together, uh, Public Health England and ourselves, and in seven years, we and others developed a vaccine that was licensed in 99, 2000. And when the vaccine was licensed, we vaccinated the entire population of England from two months of age to 18 years of age with this new vaccine. And the results were amazing. Uh, I'll share them with you. Here you see the 52 weeks of the year, and here you see a number of cases of meningococcus C in one of the cohorts. And basically, in red, you see the cases the year before vaccination. Every week, more cases, more cases, more cases. In yellow, uh, the year we started vaccination. Before starting vaccination, we had more cases than the year before. 
We started vaccination, plateau. Year later, disease was gone. That's incredible. That's one of the best experiences I ever had. You have, I mean, 1,000, 1,500 families, kids, are really hit by a terrible disease. And for the people I've never seen in a meningococcal case, I uh, hope you've never seen that because it's really dramatic. Um, <clears throat> not only for the family, not, not only for the people that are affected, but the family, the society, everybody knows that. And basically, uh, this happened every, uh, I mean, now it's 15, 17 years ago. You can do a back of the envelope calculation, the impact of this vaccine in the United Kingdom only. Uh, but the same thing happened in every place that this vaccine has been adopted, inc including Canada. Uh, now, <clears throat> It's amazing. This was using a technology that we didn't have in 1980. And so using this technology, pneumococcus vaccine has been done, meningococcus A has been done. But obviously, like all technology, they can solve some problems, but they cannot solve them all. There is another bacterium, which is another meningococcus, called meningococcus B. And this one is very similar to the other one, as a polysaccharide capsule as a repeating unit that is repeated many times. But unfortunately, there is a problem with this repeating unit. The chemical structure is shown down here. It's a sialic acid, pretty uh, ubiquitous uh, sugar. But it's linked in a position alpha 2,8. And this position is identical. This, it makes a polysaccharide, which is identical in structure, to a, a polysaccharide, which is in our glycoproteins. So this polysaccharide, this polysialic acid, is present in our brain, in our regenerating tissues, during embryogenesis, everywhere. So our, our immune system cannot recognize this polysaccharide of meningococcus B as something that comes from a bacterium because it belongs to us. It's a cell function. So all this beautiful technology that uh, I just described couldn't help for meningococcus B. And we and others well, many others before me, tried to solve the problem of meningococcus B since the 1960s. And was one failure after the other. When I was so excited about meningococcus C, I tried, also tried to solve the problem of meningococcus B. And I tried. I tried all the technologies I had in the early 90s. And I failed, like all the others. I came to the conclusion that with the technologies that we had at that time, we could not solve meningococcus B. I realized that our people, me, our peop the people in the lab, we were wasting our time trying to do something which was just impossible with what we had at that time. So I decided to stop the project. I didn't, was I didn't want to waste the time, my time and the time of my people. Uh, but the, the problem was always in mind. And so I said, if new technology come, something that we don't have today, we're going to go back again. And we are lucky. Uh, 1995, mid of the year, uh, was a beautiful publication in the journal Science describing the first genome of a living organism. It was by Craig Venter, the man that in 2000 sequenced the human genome. This was something spectacular. It was the first time we could read the information to make a living organism. The first time you actually go down and read how you could make it. And that time I thought, well, that's a new revolutionary technology. If we could actually understand and read the genome of meningococcus B, maybe I can find there the components to make a vaccine that can, I've not been able to find with the conventional technologies. And so I went to visit Craig Venter, and we started what later on we call reverse vaccinology. Uh, I asked Craig Venter whether he would, wanted to sequence the genome of meningococcus B for us. He agreed. And we started the process. And the process was very simple. We gave the DNA of the bacterium to Greg Venter. He sequenced the uh, genome, put the information in the computer. We, in collaboration with Richard Marx and Oxford University, tried to understand what's written in the genome. And we found that in the genome, there were genes coding for 2,158 genes, which was good too many to make a vaccine. So we had to go down and, and so we asked the computer, how many of those genes code for proteins which will be on the surface of the, of the bacteria? We wanted proteins on the surface because we, want, we wanted the, uh, 
targets that will be recognized by antibodies, that will recognize things on the surface, not on, on the inside of the bacteria. The computer told us 600. That's uh, much less than 2,000, but still a lot. But at that point, we had no choice. We had to go back to the lab and do experiments. So we uh, decided to s express in, in E. coli 600 recombinant proteins. We succeeded only with 350. Um, and then we immunized mice with 350 purified proteins. We obtained 350 sera, and we started to analyze all of them. And very shortly, we realized that we were on top of uh, what we call a gold mine. We knew we were going to make a vaccine. We didn't know exactly how the, the composition of the vaccine, but we knew that we had enough information to make it. And the reason to understand that was that we, in six months, from the moment we started to immunize animals, in six months, we had discovered 91 novel proteins that were on the surface of the bacteria. To give an idea, I put in perspective 91, the, from the beginning of microbiology, all the people who were working on the subject, and they have been described between 12 and 14. That was the history of microbiology. And now in six months, we got 91. So the power that we had was huge. And, uh, and we didn't know which one was going to make a vaccine, but really, that was the moment we understood we were going to make it. And then we selected the best of the 91, we came down with 28, which were the uh, most, import, uh, most important one because they were killing, inducing antibodies, killing the bacteria. And then we selected the best of the best of the 28, and we made, uh, selected the three that ended up in the final vaccine. And you see, the, at that time, those proteins, nobody knew they existed before we had the genome. Now we know uh, what they are. We have the crystal structure. We, they have a name. They have a function. We learn a lot about them. So that was the scientific discovery. We published the scientific discovery in two papers in science. We were very excited about 2000. One paper on the sequence, one paper on the same discovery. And that was the year 2000. The science was done. But then the vaccine became available in Europe or in Canada only in 2013. What did I do all these years? Well, I did what. Most of the people don't know what it takes to translate a scientific discovery into a product that is approved and available in the pharmacy. 13 years. And what do you do? You do a kind of work that doesn't, usually doesn't end up in top journals. It's not really highly published. published. Um, and it's not so exciting, sometimes it's boring, but it's a, a work that you absolutely need to do to make sure you bring safe, and efficacious products to, to the people. And what you do, basically, you characterize your proteins, you do the toxicology, you do the uh, uh, scale up from the laboratory to industrial scale, you do phase one clinical trials, phase two, phase three, uh, you build a manufacturing plant because you want to manufacture that, uh, you invest several hundred millions, sometimes a billion, and at, at the end of the thing, you have like a, billion, a million page or report that you present to the regulatory agencies, and the regulatory agencies read those things, so they ask a lot of tough questions. And once they are satisfied with those tough questions, they may, they eventually they may say, okay, we're convinced that you have a product which is safe and efficacious, now you can, now you can uh, sell it. And 13 years. Uh, to give a better idea how long it takes, I show this slide. This was uh, Craig Venter and I, 2001, celebrating the science. And if you really want to understand how long it takes, or what it takes to develop, to translate the scientific discovery into a product, look at my hair at that time, and look <laughs> at my hair today, and you will realize what it takes. So uh, the vaccine was licensed. Now it's licensed also in the US. Uh, few uh, uh, episodes uh, in Princeton, at some point, the vaccine was licensed in, in Europe uh, and in Canada and in Australia, not at, yet in the US because the FDA was asking more tougher questions than the other agencies. But at some point, the, there was an outbreak in Princeton. Uh, four or five people came down with meningococcus. Uh, B, the next one, 
at the risk of dying, uh, people panicked, and the FDA basically called us one day and said, we need your vaccine. I said, well, that's what we wanted to give you all the time. You ask all these tough questions. And, and they said, well, no more questions, come in. <laughs> and so basically, the, uh, uh, the vaccine was in, uh, used, uh, not, yet, uh, not yet licensed in the US. Uh, you see the students queuing to be vaccinated, no more cases there. Uh, the, and then they uh, really accelerated the license uh, of the vaccine, they nominated, this was the first vaccine that got the designation of breakthrough therapy, really to accelerate the, 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 the development, the licensure. The other important thing is that since September 2015, uh, all the newborns in the United Kingdom are being vaccinated with this vaccine. And from the preliminary data, some of which have been published already, you see the same thing we saw with the meningococcus. Cases are, are going down uh, remarkably. And so there, this vaccine is already saving lives in the United Kingdom and other places where the vaccine is being used. Uh, there's an episode also in Canada, a region called Seguinella and Gen. And uh, 300,000 people, very, very, very small, the province of Quebec. And uh, in 2014, this region had the highest incidence of meningococcus B in Canada. So the Philippe de Valls, a, a pediatrician there, decided to vaccinate the entire population of this region with the vaccine. And in, from May to July, he vaccinated the entire population from two months of age to 20 years of age with the vaccine, and no more cases. That's the only region in Canada that no more cases of meningococcus B right now. So it's working everywhere. Bottom line, the message I want to leave you with is that with two technologies we didn't have in 1980, we've been able to conquer all bacteria that cause uh, meningococcal meningitis. So if we use that vaccine, we'll be able to free our planet for another disease. Now, uh, obviously genomics cannot be applied only for meningococcus B. You can apply it to many other things. And uh, here is a list of bacteria that have been where we are using the reverse vaccinology. I will not go into that, but basically more, many of these bacteria are antibiotic resistance. So we believe we're gonna tackle and solve, or at least help to solve that problem as well. Uh, but what I mentioned so far was discovered 17 years ago, 20 years ago. So basically, I mean, 20 years ago, with the technologies we have today, it was the Stone Age. I mean, uh, genomes. Uh, when we did the genome with Craig Venter, it took him 14 months to do one genome of one bacteria, 14 months. Uh, today, we can do hundreds of genomes per day, thousands, if you like. So, I mean, when I look back, it looks like, a, I mean, how could it work so slowly at that time? And so what is this? What is the te technology allowing us to do today? It's what I call reverse vaccinology 2.0. And then, as I said, today we use, before we started uh, any designing any vaccine, we do hundreds, thousands of, of genomes. We collect bacteria from all over the world, we sequence the genomes, and we do the epidemiology, and then we start to design the vaccine. Then we have proteomics. We use all the proteomics, we put information in the computer. Then today we do crystal structure of uh, structure of the antigens, a cryo-electron microscopy, NMR, and we put information in the computer. And then we can isolate human monoclonal antibody from convalescent people that are protective, and we put that information in the computer. And now when we start to design these things, basically we can make, uh, <coughs> design the vaccines in a completely different way. And perhaps the most uh, the newest thing is in the cancer field. Today, uh, there is a lot of discussion making new vaccines, therapeutic vaccines, by sequencing the genome of healthy tissue, the genome of the tumors, identifying the mutations, and identifying the neoantigens, and making a va personalized vaccines. That's the, probably the most advanced thing of using genomics or reverse vaccinology, if you like, to develop vaccines. So the the field is very exciting. I'll give you another example, because it's an example of something that five years ago we didn't know how to make. And this is about uh, structural vaccine, and it's about respiratory syncytia virus. This is a virus that uh, basically 
infects every single child in the first few months of life. Uh, and in our country, it basically causes most of, uh, is a major cause of hospitalization. In low-income countries, it's a major cause of mortality. Uh, people wanted a vaccine against uh, this virus since 1950s. First big failure to make this vaccine was 1967. Last failure was three months ago. So very consistent. Now, <clears throat> why did we fail for so many years? And the bottom line is because we didn't know what, what we were doing. And today what we know is that the protein the, that we can use to make this, uh, this vaccine is a, is a trimer, which is on the surface of the virus, called, uh, called a fusion protein. This protein is not just a protein, it's a machine. It's a, ma it's a protein with a conformation which is closed, the one you see here. Uh, but then, when it touches the receptor in our cells, basically changes the conformation and gets to this conformation, which is post-fusion. In doing that, it poses hydrophobic in, uh, peptides that basically enter into our membranes and, and basically anchor the virus to our membrane, fuses the viral membrane to our membranes, and injects the nucleic acid. That's the infection. Now, these machines are the basis for vaccines against influenza, against many, uh, many other, uh, the, the HIV, and many other things. The problem with uh, RSV is that this conformation is unstable. It's only theoretical. That doesn't exist. We, when we try to purify, it's there. A moment later, it's gone. And basically, it goes in this direction. And the problem is that this one is a good, very good vaccine. This is a terrible vaccine. So how do you solve the problem? We know what the vaccine, a good vaccine will be, but that protein is unstable. And that's the reason we failed so many times. So recently, us and the group at the NIH uh, got this, finally, we got the structure, uh, crystal structure of the two conformations. Actually, we did this one. The, the group at NIH was more successful in doing this one. And this is the trimer. And down here, you have the monomers. Now, this is the bad vaccine. And this is the good vaccine. Uh, how do you, this is very unstable. How do you keep it? How do you solve the problem? Now, look at these two amino acids, this red one and this red one. They are very far apart in, the, uh, in this bad conformation. They are very close together in this conformation. So what do you do? You change these two amino acids into two cysteines. They make a disulfide bridge. And the trick is done. Now, I believe that even a child could do it today. As there are two amino acids that are far apart, they're close together, let's link them, make it easy. But it was absolutely impossible, absolutely impossible before we got the crystal structure of these two things. So that's the way a new technology and the ability of doing the crystal structure of these things allow us to solve new problems. And so I'll, I'll tell you, I mean, five years ago, we didn't know how to do this. And today, it looks easy. And that's what's happening every day. New adjuvants, synthetic uh, uh, RNAs, uh, uh, synthetic biology is really completely changing what we do. And uh, my prediction is that today, we can do things that we were not able to do five years ago. Uh, in, uh, Five years, we'll be able to do things that we can do today. And the technology are really moving in such a way that vaccines will continue to contribute to our society by conquering new diseases in the future. And I think uh, I'll stop there with that message. Uh, but this is really, we're living in a very exciting uh, field. I mean, vaccines are the oldest medical intervention. Uh, the impact on, our, uh, on mankind has been huge told you 35 years of life, life expectancy. But the impact in the future could be even bigger. So with that message, I want to leave you. Thank you. Mm -hmm.